just so I don't implode from anxiety if you want to start us off here. Yeah, we good to go? You're good to go. Did you get a picture from here? Sweet, okay, good afternoon. Not everyone. right now. Thanks Maybe for afternoon. coming along. Uh, this is our last semis, uh, seminar of the semester, and we've got Natasha Voss presenting her uh, master's work, which is very cool. Uh, and Natasha comes to us from St. Cloud, Minnesota, a few hours up the road on the I 94, um, not too far away. Went to St. Cloud State University for her undergrad, started off in journalism, but took an AOS 100 class and very much changed her course, has been AOS ever since. Um, at the end of her undergrad, she got really interested in satellite research and uh, sort of observations of the Earth system. Even got Calypso tattooed <laughs> on her wrist, I think. Uh, but following that, she joined uh, Wisconsin in 2021 uh, with Tristan Lequier on the Pre-Fire team on the science, yeah, becoming a team member of the science team um, for Pre-Fire in 2021. Um, has been there ever since. Um, a very cool aspect of Natasha's work is she's very much in the operational side of Pre-Fire, so she's seen how these products are being built, and a lot of this work is actually going into a level three product um, as part of Prefire, which is very cool. So she gets to see a very different side of working with satellite data and how it actually gets to being publicly usable, um, which is awesome. Uh, she's worked a lot with the Prefire team, especially uh, Tim Michaels and Carl Mattingly. Um, a lot of the team is also over at uh, EGU at the moment, where a few of the names here are, are missing. Um, so yeah, take it away. All right. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, so I do want to thank all of you for being here, and thank you, Hamish, for introducing me. Tristan is at AGU right now. Um, and we are going to talk about some pre-fire intersections today. And so I normally don't do uh, an overview ahead of my presentation, but I wanted to give you kind of a rough idea of where we're headed. So just to start off, uh, so my thesis work that I'm presenting today is a small part of all of the research going into the pre-fire launch coming up in May. And so we're gonna to wanna to talk about pre-fire. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about what motivated the mission, and then we're gonna work our way up to talking about the intersections. Um, and then I left this a little bit vague, but then we're gonna chat about my two primary objectives, and then I'll talk about the fourth footprint method that I used. And then this is where we're gonna spend most of our time. So uh, this is the bulk of my thesis. So I did a spatial and temporal analysis of our intersections. And so we're gonna talk a lot about those. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at a hypothetical intersection during an Arctic heat wave. And then if you zoned out, that's okay. I'll go back and I'll summarize what I talked about. And then we're gonna end with some long-winded, no, it'll be short acknowledgement. So um, we're actually gonna start off by looking at outboard long wave radiation. So this is a figure that is pretty near and dear to the pre-fire mission. Um, so we look at the top of the plot, we've got our annual mean all sky outgoing radiation for 2019. And what that figure shows us is exactly what we would expect, right? So in our low latitudes where it's warm and we don't have persistent clouds, we see that overall we have the most outgoing long wave radiation there. And then as we start climbing toward the poles or we move in regions with persistent cold cloud tops, at that point we see that our total outgoing radiation goes down, right? So that's not su surprising, we would expect that. But what's a little bit more interesting is the bottom part of this, this figure. Um, so what that's telling us is every region that's plotted up there, it's telling us the overall fraction of the total outgoing radiation that falls in the, the far infrared. And so the wavelengths that comprise the, the far infrared actually depends on who you ask. Um, but we generally take it to be the infrared spectra that are at 15 microns or longer in wavelength. And so what we see there is actually the exact opposite. Right, so we see, uh, if I can draw your attention to the ice sheets, uh, just the polar regions in general, we see that we're hovering at about 60 to 65% of all of our outgoing radiation is in the far infrared spectra. And so obviously that's a huge amount that's dominating the outgoing radiation there. And then if we look at elevated regions like the Tibetan Plateau, or if we look at regions of you know, deep convection, we see that there we also have some pretty high relative fractions overall. Um, but what I think is extremely interesting to note, um, and we should not overlook it, even in our low latitudes where the relative fraction of far infrared is you know, small compared to elsewhere, we see that we're hovering at about 40%. And so that is not a small number. So clearly the far infrared, uh, outgoing far infrared is extremely important to our energy budget. And so this is a, a huge, kind of impetus for pre-fire. This is kind of telling the story of pre-fire. 
so much so that we're actually going to continue on and look at, we're going to look at outgoing radiation, and this time it is spectrally resolved. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the all-sky spectral flux for 2019. We've got our global annual mean, and then the Arctic in September and the Antarctic in September. And if I can just draw your attention to the, the part of our spectra that is at 15 wavelengths or longer, and I'll put a little box over it. So the far infrared is in this box. And so first of all, we can see that, again, a lot of our outgoing radiation falls within the far infrared. But what you can't tell just by looking at this plot is that these values here are not constrained by narrow band observations. So what you're looking at is you're looking at extrapolated spectral flux that have been extrapolated from mid-infrared observations, right? So, and the reason that we don't have, we can't, you know, sort of resolve the, the spectral flux in the far infrared at this point is because we have not had a modern narrowband far infrared satellite mission in almost half a century, right? So. Um, there's a couple reasons for that that we don't really have time to get into. It'll, it'll kind of tie into some of my explanations later, but for right now, we'll just kind of note that there's this observational gap that we have to contend with. And so, our answer to that is the pre-fire mission. Um, so just to kind of start off with an overview, uh, so it's a pre-fire shorthand for the Polar Radiant Energy in the Far Infrared Experiment. And so pre-fire is a moderate resolution polar mission that's going to be launching pretty soon. So we're going to be shooting up two satellites in May. And I'm going to talk a lot more about the satellites on the next slide. Um, excuse me, but for right now, I just want to note that either satellite will be carrying a thermal infrared spectrometer, which we call TERS, and either TERS will be measuring top of atm atmosphere radiances and we're gonna be going from about five to 54 microns, and we can resolve up to about 0.86 microns. Um, so, to just kind of boil down the mission in a couple of talking points or a couple of bullet points, uh, I just wanna point out that we are going to be giving priority to a couple things. One of them is going to be the surface emissivity in the far infrared. And so if we take a look at this figure from Long et al. 2016, uh, it's showing us emissivity values for a handful of different surface types across a range of different wavelengths. This is about 15 microns, so far infrared is over here. And so these emissivity val values, excuse me, are generally not constrained by observations. So these are calculated by first principle calculations, basically. And so if you know anything about the far infrared, and this ties into why there's this observational gap, uh, you know that the far infrared is extremely sensitive to water vapor. And so that means that it's can be impossible or nearly impossible to observe the surface um, just because water vapor dominates the, the signal. But we are a polar mission, so we do believe that we'll have some opportunities, some good opportunities to look at the surface because poles tend to be pretty dry. And then the other primary objective of pre-fire is to better constrain the atmospheric greenhouse effect across those range of wavelengths. Um, so that's exactly what it sounds like, so we want to better constrain how changes in things like the temperature, moisture, cloud cover, et cetera, impact outgoing long wave radiation. And I'm gonna take a quick drink, so I have a very dry mouth, so give me just one moment. Whew, okay. All right, so uh, I kind of alluded to them before, but we are going to be launching two satellites called CubeSats. So they're very itty bitty, that's actually a picture of them. Uh, it looks bigger than it, than it actually is, I guess, just because of the solar panels, but they're very small and they don't have any fuel, so they're very light. And so, until we're in orbit, we're not gonna know the exact orbit that we achieve, but we are targeting the following. So we wanna be sun synchronous, so we are about 98 degrees as far as our inclination angle. And so what that means is that we'll have near global coverage. So our little CubeSats are gonna be able to see the world from about 82 south to 82 north. And we are also targeting a relatively low altitude of 540 kilometers. And then I also just wanted to note that they will have separate ML TANs. And so basically what that means is that they are separate sun synchronous orbits. So they're separated longitudinally. And so there was a lot of planning that went into this configuration because this sort of combination of orbit parameters will give rise to frequent resampling. And so when I say pre-fire intersections, which is what we're gonna spend our time talking about today, that's what I'm referring to. So I'm gonna go into detail about what our intersections are, 
And so just to start off, we're going to look at one simulated orbit of a single CubeSat, shown in the pink. Um, I do want to make sure I'm not being confusing. So when we're talking about a simulated orbit, in the context of pre-fire, we also call that a granule. So if you hear granule, just know I mean I'm talking about a simulated orbit. And so I just want to note that one orbit for either CubeSat is about 95 minutes long, so about an hour and a half. And that, so that means in one day, we're going to have about 15 orbits per CubeSat. And so this is just one CubeSat. And what I hope to point out very clearly with my big annotation there is that these regions where this one CubeSat looks at one place on Earth and then at some undefined time later looks at the same place, that is what we are calling a self-intersection. And so now we're going to plot CubeSat 2, so one day of CubeSat 2 shown in the blue. And we see that CubeSat 2 also has its own self-intersections, right? And then we have another type that sneaks up on us. And uh, we don't have a fun name for it. We just call it Sat1 and Sat2 intersection. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's where one CubeSat looks at a region and the other CubeSat looks at that same region sometime later. And so uh, before we zoom in on an intersection, because that will be important to see what it looks like up close, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on or kind of zoom out rather on, uh, on, on a cross-track segment for each orbit. So that's what I have shown in the boxes. So for either orbit, in the cross-track direction, we actually have eight what we call footprints. And so those are two-dimensional viewing regions projected on Earth. And you can see they're discontinuous, right? So there is a spacing in between them. And so each of our long track segments is, so how do I word this? So these are our cross-track segments and in the long track direction, there are over 8,100 of them in the simulated orbits. And so now, if we zoom in on an arbitrary intersection over Antarctica, this is what we see when we're a little bit closer to an intersection. And so uh, you can see you do have the gaps in between, but for the most part, we are looking at a diamond region where we have co-located or approximately co-located you know, fields of view. And so if you keep in mind, the objectives that I highlighted, specifically looking at changes and trying to constrain how those changes impact outgoing radiation, hopefully that will kind of give you the impression, and I'll, by the end hopefully we'll have totally convinced you, but for right now, hopefully you have the impression that these intersections will be extremely important to the mission because they will help us observe local changes in the atmosphere and at the surface. And so that brings me finally to my, my research objectives. And so they were twofold. So first of all, uh, the main part of my thesis was to investigate the spatial and temporal pattern of the intersections, which I'm kind of loosely calling a statistical analysis, uh, soft statistics, but nonetheless, we just want to know where and when we would expect them. And so this is really important to note, these are hypothetical, right? So obviously we don't have the CubeSats in orbit yet, so this is just our, uh, you know, sort of approximation of where they will be or could potentially be based on you know, they're constrained by our, our orbit targets. So they are considered realistic, but it is just worth noting that they're hypothetical. And then the second part of my thesis was to demonstrate intersection utility. So in other words, we want to apply an intersection in like a hypothetical way to try to demonstrate how it could be useful to the mission overall. And so I'm going to really briefly talk about this because it's very straightforward, but um, we're going to go back to our arbitrary intersection again. And so you can see we've got the age footprints for either orbit. And so if we want to figure out or approximate where this intersection is located, one reasonable thing to do would be to approximate the true center of the intersection, right? And so the true center of this intersection is going to be somewhere where the interior most footprints intersect. And since we have eight footprints, that means the fourth and the fifth footprint are going to be our central most footprint. So it didn't matter which one we chose, so we chose the fourth footprint. And so to see what that looks like, we'll zoom out here now on our arbitrary intersection that we've been looking at. We see we've got all eight footprints shown there. So it's exactly what it sounds like. So we just neglect all but the four footprints. We find where they intersect, shown with the star, and we say this is a decent approximation of the center of this intersection. And so um, with that method, I analyzed two continuous months of simulated orbits and now I, I want to make this point because it's very important. So I had mentioned that we're targeting 540 kilometers for an altitude, but I also mentioned, um, if you caught it, that we, we don't have any fuel. So once we're 
you know, once we shoot them off, um, we're not going to be able to lower them or raise them. And so to make this as realistic as possible, we first of all assumed that they're not going to exactly achieve 540 kilometer altitude. And then we also made them different altitudes because that is the most realistic scenario. And then there's applied drake as well to make it more realistic. Um, and so with that in mind, I identified all intersections over that two month period that were plus or minus 48 hours of each orbit in that, over that duration. And then I categorized them by latitude and the elapsed time between sampling. And just a quick note, so I, I, I refer to this as a time difference. So if I say time difference, I'm literally just referring to the difference in the crossover times. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the results. Um, so uh, this is over the, the two month period. I'm gonna show you a map, right, so it's fun to see them, but there's so many of them that it makes sense to start with kind of digesting them bit by bit. Um, but one thing I wanted to note is that throughout my analysis, I consider each intersection type separately. So SAT1 self-intersections, SAT2 self-intersections, and SAT1, SAT2 intersections. Um, and then I've got three different time grouping, groupings here, excuse me. But one thing I want to just kind of emphasize is that with pre-fire, one of the things that makes these intersections so special is the fact that we'll have shorter term revisits, right? That's, that's a special feature of pre-fire. And so because of that, we are going to focus just on our intersections that are plus or minus 12 hours. And we're going to do that for basically the entire remainder of my uh, presentation. And so what we can see is over the full two month period, we had a little over 14,000 self intersections, either type, and then we had over 27,500 SAT1, SAT2 intersections. So we're talking about a lot of intersections. This is just a two month period. And uh, just to visualize the distribution, and I, I'm sorry if these colors are not, they never show up the way they do on the computer, so I'm sorry if it's a little unclear, but so this is pink, this is our SAT1 self intersections, uh, this is blue, our SAT2 self intersections, and this is SAT1, SAT2 intersections. And as we can see, about half of our intersections are SAT1, SAT2, and then a quarter, uh, or a quarter each of the self intersections are the contributions we get from those intersection types. And then um, just to, to clarify or to emphasize what this tells us, um, so I'm just showing you that if we lost one of the CubeSats for either reason, we would actually lose about three quarters of our intersections. So it's very good to have two, it's kind of the main takeaway there. And so uh, the two month period was just an arbitrary, arbitrarily long period, um, but I wanted to get a better idea of what we would expect on a daily time scale. And so that's what I'm showing you here. So we've got each of our intersection types for the row, each row, and then um, just to make sure I'm not being confusing, the first figure is our global intersections and what's in parentheses shows us our polar intersections. And so what we can see if we consider these together since the numbers are similar, we can see that based on the simulation, in a given day we would expect about 240 global intersections for the self-intersection type. And in the poles, we would have about 180 in either pole. And then if we look at the minimum and the maximum, the next column's over, we see that our range is, is pretty tight, right? So we're ranging from about 240 to 247 globally <coughs> per day, uh, or 180 to 186 in the poles per day. So there's not a whole lot of variability there. But if we look at our last intersect, you're gonna see a pattern here that this one is much different than these. So um, globally, for our SAT1, SAT2 intersections, we have over 470 per day. In the poles, we're gonna have about 360 per day. Again, to the extent that we achieve orbit you know, parameters that are similar to, to what I analyzed. And then if we look at the range, we see that globally we have a, a very large range, and in the poles as well. So for this intersection type, we actually range from about 450 per day to 520, roughly. And in the poles, we range from about 330 to 400. And so taking this all together, that tells us, first of all, that yes, we're going to see a lot of intersections, like I sort of mentioned before. So hundreds of intersections per type per day. And we have greater variability in this that one set of intersections. And so the next thing that I did, because we are concerned with where they will occur um, given the simulation, I just took the intersection centers over the full two month period and I bin them every five degree latitude and I did that for both hemispheres. And so um, to try to visualize this as best as I could, I color coded the, the bins. So the warm colors, as you can see, are the low latitudes. 
the light and dark greens are our mid latitudes, and then the high latitudes are the blues and the purple. And so first of all, we see that we have basically the same distribution across hemispheres, right? There's no meaningful difference. So in either hemisphere, about an eighth of our intersections are going to be in the low latitudes, roughly another eighth will be in the mid latitudes, and then three quarters of our intersections are in the high latitudes. And so that's good to see, first of all, right, we're a polar mission, but I do want to just note that that's not an accident, right? That's not an incidental. There was a lot of research, like I said, that went into analyzing what orbit configurations we could uh, put together in order to achieve a lot of high latitude resampling. So my job is really just to be a little bit more exact, but you know, we, going into the mission, we, do, we had this expectation that we would have a lot of high latitude intersections. And so um, just looking at the, the bar chart here, um, we just kind of get a good idea of where we're going to have some gaps in coverage. So obviously, well, the gap here, we have limited coverage in the low and mid latitudes. But then even in our high latitudes, we are going to see some gaps in coverage for this intersection type set, one self intersection. And so I don't want to be redundant. Just know that SAT2 self intersections look basically the same. So we have a sprinkle in our low latitudes, a sprinkle of intersections in our mid, and then most of our intersections occurring in the high latitudes. And we see we have similar gaps in coverage for that intersection type. And so now we're going to talk about this intersection type, which is, as you can kind of see, a lot different. So first of all, we can, well, actually, first of all, what I should note is that the y-axis on our bar charts is roughly double what we saw before. So just keep that in mind if you're comparing them in your head. Uh, but nonetheless, we see we've got the whole rainbow, right? So we can visually see that we are going to have basically every latitude band covered up to our maximum viewing latitude of 82 north and south. And so um, we also get the impression just by eyeballing this that we have a roughly monotonic increase in the number of intersections as we move uh, to higher latitudes. And so now we're going to build in a time component that's also extremely important. So uh, what I'm going to do is just show you an example of each orbit and then go from there. So this is a CubeSat 1 orbit shown in the black. And then I color coded the centers of every intersection this particular orbit had with itself, plus or minus 12 hours. And so first thing I want to note is that for every CubeSat 1 orbit, it will have 32 self-intersections. So that will be constant. And then another really important thing, in fact, probably the most important thing to note on this slide, we can see we have you know, dark colors in our low latitudes. And then as we ascend, or I guess descend, as we go to either pole, um, we see that we're getting lighter and lighter. And so what that tells us is that we have a monotonic decrease in our time difference as we move to higher latitudes. So they're getting shorter and shorter. And then I guess just for completeness, I wanted to note as well that intersections do come in ascending and descending pairs. So where we have an intersection of a given time difference on the ascending segment of each orbit, we can look in roughly the equal and opposite latitude on the descending segment and see the same time difference there. Okay, so I'm going to show you the full two months, and this is what that looks like. So this is just the center of the intersections, but the main takeaway, and this is maybe maybe the most important slide, or one of the most important slides here, so um, that I'm going to show you. So what we see is that we have time invariant spatial coverage. So with respect to the latitude and the time for a SAT1 self intersection, we have constant coverage. And I'm sorry, I need to take another drink. Bear with me. They spill all, all over. Okay. Um, so now, just for completeness, I'm going to show you the next self intersection. But as you can see, it's going to be a little redundant, so I'm not going to go over everything again. But just note to yourself that we get the exact same pattern. Um, so we still have shorter and shorter intersections as we move to the poles. And we again have our ascending and descending pair of intersections. And again, it looks exactly the same. So uh, it might be worth noting that the, the exact location of the intersections is not precisely the same across self-intersections. But for the most part, we do have our constant latitude bands. And I actually think I forgot to mention we have eight in each hemisphere, so north and south. So constant coverage overall. And so uh, now we're going to look at our, our other intersection types, that one, that two. And so the first thing that I'm going to note is that we can already see this is going to be different, right? So we range from about 30 to 34 intersections per either CubeSat orbit. 
Um, so, so right there, that tells us that we have variability there. We don't have a constant number of intersections per orbit. And then the other really important thing to note, you know, we can see in our low latitudes, we've got lighter colors. So we actually have some shorter term intersections in our low latitudes or mid latitudes here. And then as we move to the pole, we see the whole shebang, right? So we see we've got some really rapid intersections, and then we also have intersections that are about 12 hours long. So for this intersection type between CubeSats, we're going to have very good temporal coverage, specifically in the high latitudes. And so whew, um, this is the full two months. Um, and so now hopefully you can see why I didn't start by showing you the full two months right off the bat. Um, so first of all, it looks very different, right? It looks nothing like what we saw with the other intersection types. And so what this tells us, among other things, is that we have time varying spatial coverage when we refer to the intersections between the CubeSats. So we have cyclic rather than constant spatial and temporal coverage. So that is a huge difference. We also have greater spatial and temporal coverage um, as well with this intersection type. And so the last thing I did before we move on to my case study, um, I took the, all of the intersections, all of their centers, and I just bin them with respect to time. And so I, I kind of designed the bin so that we can emphasize the shorter term intersection. So we go, uh, the first bin is less than a half an hour, half an hour to one hour, one to three hours, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12. I'm sorry if that's hard to read, but that's nine to 12. And so then what I did is I took the frequency, so the percent of all of the days in the two month period where we saw intersections in those bins, and then I took the mean per day. And so I did that for all three types. I'm just consolidating the self intersections. As you know by now, they're basically, you know, the pattern is basically identical. And so what we see here is that we have static coverage. We don't have any, interse you know, intersections in these bins, and that's not surprising. We're never gonna have an intersection that is within itself for one orbit, and an orbit is an hour and a half long, so we're not, you know, this, these are just not applicable to this intersection type. But 100% of the time, we will have intersections in those bins for self-intersections. And then we just see that the nine to 12 hour bin has the most number overall, so we have kind of longer intersections overall in this, in self-intersection type. And so anyway, so just to kind of wrap this up, um, for SAT1, SAT2 intersections, I did the same thing, and we see a difference yet again. So about two-thirds of the time, we actually see intersections that are within a half an hour. And so just for time constraints, I can't really get into it too much, but this is extremely important to the mission. So keeping in mind that we're going to have two different sensors, right, looking at the same region, we want to make sure that if there's a difference in radiances, that that corresponds to a meaningful difference on the scene. And so these short-term intersections, what I sometimes call rapid revisits, those are going to be really important for calibration. So just want that to be in your mind, because that is extremely important to note. Um, but then 40% of the time, we do have intersections between half an hour and one. And then 100% of the time, we will have intersections in the other bins. And then I'll just note here that uh, we actually see the most number of SAT1, SAT2 intersections in our three to six hour bin. Um, so they tend to be a little bit shorter, is kind of one thing this implies. And then I'm going to show you, we're going to go kind of day by day. So what I did is I color coded all the intersection centers according to the time bins we just looked at. And so the squares and the circles represent the self intersections. And then the triangles are our SAT1, SAT2 intersection. So we're going to move ahead day by day. So that's what that looks like. And so a couple things. So what this is showing us is that as we move forward in time, all of our intersections are moving eastward. But then the other thing that hopefully stands out to you is that our triangles are they're doing you know north and south movement. And so that looks like, if you look closely, it looks like there's, I can play it again, but it looks like there is some sort of oscillation happening. And so we want to be really careful, since I did look at simulated orbits, uh, we don't know the extent to which this will translate operationally. But in the simulated orbits, there was a repeat in the SAT1, SAT2 intersections of about three weeks. So I just wanted to note that. All right, we are getting there. Um, so now we're going to jump to the next part. It's, it's a shorter part, but important to note. So once we had our intersections mapped out, we knew kind of where and when they occurred, what we did is we overlaid the intersections on reanalysis data. And it was a little bit more systematic than that, but basically that's what we did. And what we were looking for is interesting hypothetical case studies. 
And so once we found regions where our hypothetical simulated intersections captured something of interest, at that point what we did is we interpolated the reanalysis data to each of the footprints, which I'll show you, and then from there I evaluated the simulated radiances just to know or to get an idea of what we would expect to see from the satellite's perspective. And so we're going to look at a very simple case, an Arctic heat wave case. Um, so if you think back to the end of June, early July of 2021, uh, the eastern Siberian region and the Arctic basin kind of throughout had a pretty wicked heat wave. And so what we're going to do is just plop an, an intersection down somewhere in the Arctic during this time. And we're going to talk about that. So. Um, I do want to note, this is a highly, highly demonstrative case. This is not meant to be a, a hard science exhaustive case. It's just to demonstrate a point. And so we are going to neglect clouds. We'll never be able to do that with real data, but for demonstrating how we use the intersections, we'll just neglect them for the next 10 minutes. Okay, so this is the intersection that we're looking at here. Um, so this is a SAT-2 self intersection, and it is coastal. So uh, the upper part, you'll see it better next next slide, but the upper part is actually on land, and then uh, the kind of lower part of the diamond is in a marginal sea ice region in the East Siberian Sea. And so this whole time I've been talking about intersections that are plus or you know, minus 12 hours, and I am looking at a day and a half long here, um, but that's mostly because I wanted to show you an intersection where there was some well-defined change, and sometimes that's a little bit easier to do on a longer time scale. So, Looking at this here, um, what we have is we're kind of zoomed in on our intersection now, land and sea. Um, I have the bright color just so you can see the colors, of course, but um, so this is interpolated reanalysis skin temperature to each of the footprints of the diamond. And so because this, you know, big chunk of our intersection is over seawater, I did take the freezing point to be with respect to seawater, negative 1.8 Celsius. So, um, if we just eyeball this, we can see we have a pretty clear warming, right? It's not ambiguous. So here we have a region that was below freezing with respect to seawater. By the time we looked at it again a day and a half later, we don't have any pixels that are below the freezing point of seawater. Um, and then over land, you can kind of tell, and it will be more clear soon, but you can tell we have pretty fairly intense warming there as well. Um, one thing I just want to really quick note so if we were to use skin, proc or skin temperature excuse me, as a proxy for sea ice melt, then this looks like we have melt going on. But in the reanalysis, we didn't have a clear signature of that, so I'm not going to treat this as a sea ice melt case. So we're just going to treat this as a very simple kind of warming, and then we'll look at water vapor. But one of the reasons I chose this intersection is because I hope that it shows you that once we actually have intersections, we are going to capture sea ice melt. And you know, there's a lot that we can do with that as far as constraining outgoing radiation, which I hope to demonstrate in the next couple of slides. But, um, but for right now, we'll just take this as a clear case of warming. Okay, and so we can do the same thing with our total column water vapor. And so again, it has been interpolated to our footprints. Um, and what we see is kind of a, a reversal in moisture. And so the first time we looked at this region, we had some relatively high moisture values, and then as we moved offshore, we're drying out a little bit. And then the second time, a day and a half later, it's the opposite, right? So we've dried out quite a bit over the land, and then as we move offshore, we see that we're getting you know, higher moisture values relative to the onshore part. And so now I'm, I'm just gonna give you the impression of what the satellites would see. Because remember, we, we're gonna, we have TERS, right? Those are spectrometers, so I'm gonna loop through a handful of different channels. Uh, there, are, there will be over 60 of them, and these are just a handful, like I said, but. And so what we can see, and what most of us already know, right, is that different wavelengths respond to different things, or have no response at all. And so you can kind of get the impression as we loop through that we, it looks like in some of these cases, the warming is coming through. In other cases, we've got more of the moisture response, and then 40 microns at the bottom there, that's pretty far in the infra, you know, far infrared. It uh, doesn't seem to have any response. Um, and so what we get from these intersections is going to depend not only on the portion of the intersection that we analyze and what's going on there, but also what, what wavelength we look at. And so what I'm going to do is just a really quick and dirty demonstration here um, to wrap things up. But what I did with this particular intersection is I took <coughs> the points where the eight footprints of our first orbit intersect the eight footprints of the second orbit. 
And so what we get are these 64 common regions or common pixels, I'm kind of loosely calling them. And so this is our skin temperature in the context of just the common regions. And then this is just the total column water vapor also uh, in the context of our common areas. And then since we're looking at roughly the same place, we can just take a difference. So that's what I'm showing you here. And in all of these cases, we can see we've got you know, a bigger response on the land. We've got more heating by the coast, but on the land. And then we can see, you know, we have marginally more greater moisture offshore, but as we move inland, we're getting drier and drier. And so what I did is I just took the pixel that had the greatest warming, um, which wasn't dramatic, right? It's not a dramatic warming, but it is seven and a half degrees. So there was warming that occurred there. And then I took the pixel that had the, the greatest moisture loss, which is our pixel that is farthest inland. And then what I did is I, I took the radiance output, so the simulated radiances. And so we're gonna talk through what we see, and uh, so we'll go kind of step by step. But this is just starting with the pixel that underwent the most warming. So you can see I've calculated, or I kind of put this up here for a reminder, it warmed by seven and a half degrees. And then just to be complete, I did calculate a little bit of drying out as well in that region. Um, but to be clear about what we're looking at, so this is our, our radiances, or our spectra, of the first time we looked at that particular pixel, right, the pixel that warmed, and then this is our second time in the orange, and then the squares denote the central wavelengths for each of our roughly 60 <coughs> channels. And so I do have different regions kind of notated here to direct our focus, but just to start off in the region that had the greatest warming, or the, the greatest response, excuse me, we look near 11.2 microns, that's our traditional window channel. And so what we see, oh, and I should maybe just note if any of you are familiar with that term. So basically this region here is not super sensitive to water vapor. And so we usually can see pretty low in, in the atmosphere. You can get pretty low or near the surface. And so what we see is we have, we have a, a bit of a jump up, right? So we have the second time around an increase in our radiances. And so is that surprising? Probably not because we did have a little bit of warming. And keep in mind, this is obviously a very incomplete look at what's going on in the scene. We haven't looked at clouds. We haven't looked at anything else. So I'm just kind of giving you, again, a demonstrative case. But nonetheless, if we look where we're sensitive to water vapor, around 6.7 microns, or where we're partially transparent, so about 19 microns this area, uh, we do have sensitivity to water vapor, but it's, depending on how dry it is, we can sometimes see a little bit lower in the atmosphere. And then going out to about 27 microns, we're getting more and more opaque as our water vapor sensitivity increases. Uh, we don't really see changes, right? Nothing is showing up to me. I don't see any meaningful difference there. Um, and so is that disappointing that we don't see a difference? I would say no, that's not. Once we actually you know, have these spectra generated, we'll do it much more systematically than this, but once we can generate spectra for our intersections and different regions with the, within the intersection, the places where we don't have any difference actually might be more worthwhile, right? We might expect a difference here, but why we don't have differences elsewhere? Again, we didn't look at the whole, you know, we didn't look at any variable other than skin temperature and total column water vapor. So our picture is incomplete. But the fact that we don't have any changes there might be worth, worthwhile is what I'm getting at. Okay, and so we're gonna do a real quick uh, sort of repeat with the, the region that had the most moisture loss. In this case, it also had a little bit of a, of a warming as well. And so starting with our window channel, we do see a little bit of, a, of an increase there. And then this time in our areas of our spectra where we're more sensitive to water vapor, we see that our second time around, we do have you know, a greater radiance output there. And so that's not necessarily surprising, right? If, if we have more moisture the first time around, shown in the purple, we're gonna be peaking at higher, higher up in the atmosphere. And so if we kind of generally assume that it's a little bit colder, and I did look at the vertical moisture profile, or the, uh, yeah, the temperature and moisture profile, um, which I'm not showing here, but it did, um, this is consistent with what we saw in the vertical profile. And so, um, 27 microns, we don't see much of a difference. It's actually a little bit marginal. Um, I, if I could do this over again, I would have actually plotted the difference and shown you. Um, there are a couple reasons why I didn't. I was gonna show you a bunch of case studies and uh, that isn't applicable to all, all case studies, but nonetheless, 
This is just giving you a quick and dirty demonstration of the type of analyses we could maybe do once we have the intersections. Again, we'll be much more systematic about it, but um, hopefully this will help us constrain how changes in different parts of the intersections are constraining our outgoing radiation. Whew, okay, so now just to kind of go over, I threw a lot at you guys, and I know this is out of the wheelhouse of, of many of you, so I appreciate you bearing with me. Um, but our main points, right, is that we saw with any of the intersection types, we are going to expect hundreds of intersections per day, particularly in the high latitudes where about 75% of our intersections for any of the types occur. And then we do see for our self-intersections, either type, we have basically constant coverage, right, with respect to latitude and our time difference. And then we saw something totally different when we looked at SAT1, SAT2 intersections. So we saw that we had cyclic coverage with respect to you know, where they occur and the time differences. And then overall, we just had greater variability um, in that intersection type. And then the second part here, um, so kind of one of the main takeaways, and you can be the judge of if I convinced you of that. Probably not, right? We took just a very quick look at the intersections. But the idea is that we are expected to capture non-negligible changes at the surface within the atmosphere of both. And so um, the extent to which my sort of, you know, extracting the common pixels, the extent to which that will be operational isn't quite clear right now. But the idea is that we can isolate certain regions of the intersections that are approximately co-located, and those will help facilitate a good one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, and so um, I do have a lot written here, and just to be respectful of your time, I won't go over everything, but the people who are in the room, Tim Michaels, you have been just such a big support, and uh, you've just been wonderful, so thank you very much for all of your help. Hamish, thank you so much. I have very much enjoyed sharing an office with you for the last two and a half years. And then Steph, wherever you are, um, Steph, you know, you were one of the first people I met here and have always been extremely kind, so I just wanted to thank you. And then my partner, Mark, who has put up with me for 12 plus years, and then my folks and my brother, who are just exceptional people overall. And then we're gonna end with pics of my dog, and that's all I've got for you today. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, Rebecca. Great, great um, work here. Thank you. Um, how are you going to keep the CubeSats from smashing into each other? <laughs> That's a really good question. So um, we do have intersections in the simulations that appear to be near instantaneous. Mm. And I think the shortest term intersection in the simulations was about three seconds. Mm. But keep in mind, and I don't have the exact figure offhand, but they are going thousands of kilometers a second yeah. is the speed. So realistically, they, they shouldn't collide. It's also worth noting that we aren't expecting them to have identical altitudes. So even though we are achieving that, again, we're not going to be able to correct once they are in orbit. So I don't actually think that they, they that, that is physically, I guess, reasonable or possible just yeah, they're I, going so fast. I guess I just wondered that do they, with no fuel at all, except yeah. the solar panels, if they drift a little bit in their altitude, how do you correct that? We don't. Okay. And so the, the and that's a really good question. Um, so our mission, uh, baseline mission, is one year, and it is for that reason, right? So we are low orbit, so there's going to be a fair amount of drag there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that is something that we won't be able to correct for. There are um, there's like a weighting apparatus within the CubeSats mm -hmm. that we will leverage as best as we can, so we can kind of throw this sort of weight around to yeah. try to um, maneuver a little bit, but it's not nearly the same thing as having fuel and being able to course correct. Yeah. And so things could go very wrong. That is a possibility, but um, you know, CubeSats have been used in other missions, and the ones that have made it to space have, have been doing okay as far as I know, So, um, but that is a very real possibility. So. It's neat. It was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any questions? Yes. Rudra's got one online. He says, great talk, Natasha. Maybe I missed it, but does it mean that with these intersections, we can get insights about Arctic cyclones and atmospheric rivers? <laughs> it does. Yes, yes. Um, so if we go back to one slide here, way back here. So I maybe didn't emphasize this, but these are these all these time bins are different, giving us different 
potential, right? So we can look at different uh, uh, sort of events happening uh, within different time scales, right? Which is a very sloppy way of just saying that it's good that we do have this temporal range, right? Especially in our SAT one, SAT two intersections. Um, now, as far as the benefit of having longer term versus shorter term, I guess in sort of in response to Bruja's question, you know, keep in mind if we have a longer term intersection, we have a greater chance of having a more dramatic change, and so that could be very useful to us. But if we have everything in the scene changing over a long time interval, that could be a little bit more difficult to constrain what's happening and to constrain the sensitivity that a wing long wave has to different variables um, within the scene changing over time. And so some of these shorter term intersections actually might be useful. The, the tr kind of tricky part with them is that if they're on a short enough time scale, the chance that we'll actually see a meaningful change in the same location, it'll probably go down, right? Because we're crossing over the same area only a short time later. But when that happens, we actually might only see one or two variables changing. And so if that's the case, then you know it's almost as if everything else is being controlled and we just have the one or two variables that actually might help us with constraining you know, the impact or the sensitivity of the outgoing radiation a little bit more. So long-winded way of saying that all of these different time bins do represent a lot of potential. And yes, we could absolutely look at atmosphere rivers, Rudra. Yes? Let me only be one person in this room who doesn't know the answer to this question. That person would be me. But why is it that, the, that it never goes over the pole? So that's kind of just orbit mechanics. So if you take your, your inclination angle and you subtract 90 and you take the, the absolute value. So in other words, our inclination angle is about 98 degrees. And so if you take 90 minus 98, you get 8. And so you actually are going to see eight degrees less than the North Pole. <coughs> so, so yeah. If I design though, that inclination angle, if I design that? Yes, yep. Okay. And so that's one of the things that were looked at in the research leading up to the um, to the launch or the orbit parameters is one of the things that we that we were hoping to do was to maximize the high latitude degree sampling. And so um, we did see that the 98 degree uh, inclination angle, roughly 98 degrees, uh, is one of the configurations in combination with that altitude that gives us the most resampling. So I don't know if that answered your question, but we just had diff a different priority, which was you know targeting uh, these resampling regions. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yes. Another question online from Evan this time. He also says, "Nice talk," and he says, "I know you were ignoring the effect of clouds for the sake of example." But could you talk a bit about how the presence of clouds would impact your results? Oh, goodness. Well, they would impact everything. So clouds are extremely important. Um, hold on, let me just go back to my, my spectra here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it depends on the type of cloud. I, I feel like when we talk about clouds, we kind of just talk about them like a, they're a monolith, and they're not, right? So if we have ice clouds, I'll be honest with you, partially just because I'm really anxious, I don't know if I can give you a satisfactory uh, sort of explanation about specific wavelengths that would be modified. Probably our window channel, right, if we have a cloud that's going to impact if we can see in the surface. And then just in general, our channels that are sensitive to water vapor, if we have a thick, you know, liquid cloud, that is, that is absolutely going to impact how far we see to the surface. Um, but I, I think to some extent it, it is going to depend on the type of cloud, whether it's a nice cloud or, um, you know, whether it's a liquid cloud. So I'm sorry if that's a disappointing answer, but my answer to you is that it all depends. So. Yes? I forgot if you said, but how big is the footprint size of the control? I actually didn't uh, say that, so good question. So it's going to be about 12 kilometers wide. So, so it's pretty big. Is far to red like pretty homogenous in that size, or can it be very, you know, like how to represent the pixel that big or the actual radiation from it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's, so actually one of the reasons why we don't have observations or we haven't had far infrared observations from space is because we traditionally need a very big footprint because we're talking about far infrared so the frequency is you know, fairly low. And so we normally needed a uh, pretty long, uh, what's, what's the word, like an analysis time and uh, it, the footprint traditionally needed to be pretty big to get a signal. And so it's actually kind of a balance. So we want to have a big enough footprint where we do get that 
you know, the lower frequency far infrared, we do want to be able to still, still get enough energy to get a signal, but we also don't want to have too big of a footprint because if we're dealing with a very large viewing area, then we're probably not going to have a, a homogeneous viewing area, and then that is, you know, going to be something that will be challenging to contend with. So, yeah, I mean, they're pretty big, but again, it'll be helpful because we're dealing with lower frequency energy. Um, could it be challenging? Yes. Will it be challenging? Yes. So. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.